Hello everyone and welcome to Zero K April 2020 1v1 tournament. I'm your host Dominic or Chad Fury, whichever you prefer. And we're going to be starting off pretty soon as we got the Swiss round already set up, brackets already going. We have 18 players, although man, it being 17, it's not 100% clear. But hey, that's a fairly large tournament. I mean, 16, 17 players all in here. Swiss tournament. Great to see. So we're going to be starting out, I believe I'm... See, looking at, we have quite a few new faces, actually. Gold's beginning with Kush Batra, have not seen before. Nyardalok, same thing. And Iznitsny, although I don't know if they're actually going to be in-game, because they're possibly AFK, but, or, I'm away from keyboard, they we're not signed in yet. Also new. So that's pretty cool. However, I think round one... I don't think Anarchid and Dynefreund is going to be the best match to start this whole thing off with. Alright, so once we get that, we shall have the match. So, I should probably go over what's this tournament specifics, because there's always things specific to each tournament, different rules, different map rules. So, as usual, this is a best of run, best of one Swiss six round opener, and then there's tiebreak games if there's any tiebreaks that might happen, which often does happen. But first map is going to be Mercurial. For those of you who are somewhat familiar with the map pool from days past, that used to be Quicksilver, and then it got re-released as Mercurial, which is basically Quicksilver, but without the performance issues because. My goodness, Quicksilver was slow. So, this is probably going to be a fairly quick first round. Mercurial, as with Quicksilver, is a smallish map, very flat. Kind of supports jump bonds a little bit, but it's probably going to be a lot of rover starts. Maybe some tank, maybe some hovercraft. I don't expect matches to last more than about 15 minutes, just maybe even 10 minutes. Honestly, this map is a very rush-friendly map. So yeah, as mentioned, every round has one map. Actually, I should probably put that in rather than saying it's some random date. Uh... April 20... Actually, I normally do this. You get to see all the things as they happen. All right. This is definitely one of those days where the tournament is a little bit less professional than it normally is, because, meh. Y'all are here to have fun. I'm here to have fun. Let's just have some fun. Ah, oh, Kingstad, you remember the Nanali the Dawn thing, which I actually didn't say, because I usually don't say that when I'm doing tournaments, because it doesn't really flow. Oh, Quicksilver wasn't symmetric, began to where I did not know that. That's interesting knowledge. I just knew Quicksilver was very difficult to run on most computers. Hell, even my computer was kind of slowish. So, with... Alright, Mercurial, we are going! We are going to see Mercurial, which is apparently this metric. I think the... I think Quicksilver had some slight asymmetries, and I feel like the top left and bottom right, the ramps into the water weren't quite the same. It was close to symmetric, but... Cool, if Quicksilver's fully symmetric, or Mercurial's fully symmetric, and not a complete hog in every single machine that tries to run it, then that is a plus. So yeah, every round has a fixed map. And then we go to the tiebreaker, which starts with a fixed map, and then, if necessary, goes to other maps. Oh, Anarchy, come on. Sorry about that. We're just waiting on one of the players for this first match to start. 
and I don't know. So I'm a little curious to see what the players are going to go for. I'd say this is probably the most evenly matched of the first rounds, hence why I decided to go with it, because it felt like it would be a good start. But yeah, I'm feeling hovercraft. I don't know. I mean, jump bots, I don't know. I expect the players are going to go with the jumping commander, recon commander, maybe jump down, build some hovercraft factories, and then set up a bunch of daggers from there. Just Hovercraft have been super popular recently with a lot of the patch changes, buffing daggers. It's something I expect to see a lot of going forward. I am honestly kind of surprised by how popular it has been recently. I mean, it's not like it was... Uh, that was kind of unpopular. It was one of those things where you saw it occasionally with some high-level players like Golda, but you didn't really see it all that often. Of course, we could also just see just spiders, cloak bots as a popular choice in this map. And we are good to go, it looks like. Well, I say that. Anarchid's back. Dive front, come on. Harvey N and Chad predicts shield versus rover. A brave pick. Brave prediction. We shall find out momentarily as the game is ready to begin. That is not music that seems appropriate for this section. <laughs> that particular song I like having is the closeout music. If I don't know if you've all noticed that I always close the streams with that music. That particular song. I wonder if I should have it in general or just not have it in the intermission list and just somehow flip over to it when I need it at the end of a stream. It's an idea, it's not one I'm going to try to implement right now, because screw it, I don't have time. We're in the middle of a tournament. Alright, so, Dimefrein in the south, going for Hovercraft. I called it! Hovercraft with Recon Commander. Sorry, Harvey N. Your prediction doesn't quite line up. Anarchy going for Cloak Bot, so the two that I was coming up with, absolutely being played. What are we getting at for our start? Ah, well, Glaives early on from Anarchy. Dive front going for a starting quill. Interesting. Not bothering with going for something a little more aggressive. Fair to start in glaive, so that will be that'll be quite an interesting contrast here. So Anarchid going in with an early rush. Setting a bit of defenses on their own, which won't be of much use because again, we are seeing a quill start. Though the daggers are coming in fairly quickly. But I don't expect daggers to be all that... I mean, I'm not going to be all that concerned. Then one lotus. Honestly, one lotus kind of oddly placed. It covers the ramp well, though. So that's that's where it's going to have its value. So of course, the daggers actually do manage to get through the glaive. Dealing a bit of damage. And looks like Diamond is focusing far more on clearing the center of the map than they are on actually getting any aggression in. Interesting choice. And I do like it because... This map, as you see, Anarchid does have options for defending that opening cliff. And it's not like Dying Front has a huge amount of offensive capabilities. Right now, there are about half as many daggers as they need to start one-shotting mexes. And if you can't one-shot with a dagger, you're not going to be able to do... Maybe two shots sometimes, but usually one shot, that's kind of where you have to be. And one dagger actually goes down. So Dying Front slowed down just that little bit. Anarchid going to have... That much more time to actually build up what they need. So, Anarchid, what do you have in store? Reavers. 
Reaver Ball. Reaver Scythe. Oh, of course. I mean, it's Anarchid. What am I thinking? Of course, again, it's Scythes. <laughs> Scythes or possibly Gremlins, but that is, that is the Anarchid play. Cloak bots? Why, yes, I will go invisible. Actually, what I would expect to see at some point is the area cloak on the Conjurer. Because that is a thing now. For those of you who have not been following the game recently, area cloak got patched into the Conjurer. It's not just the Iris that has any more of the Conjurer as well. It's a little bit of a boost to late game for the Cloakbot Factory. I've seen it used a few times, though usually people will go just for Iris. They don't usually stick to the Conjurer area cloak. But it is a neat little thing to have just as a, I guess more of a mid-game thing. Late game you can easily afford Irises, but mid-game, it's a nice little thing to just throw in there. Like a Conjurer, a couple of Reavers cloaking in. Speaking of, Reaver coming in, getting in contact with Dying Thrones Commander. It won't be able to last that long. One Reaver, I mean, it deals some damage, but it's not going to be able to kill at all. And being forced to retreat slightly out of range of Dying Thrones Commander. Thankfully for it, it is able to outrun. No, not quite. Dying Thrones jumping in. Does not care. Knows they are going to win that fight. Absolutely does. So Anarchid losing a bit of territory as a result, but honestly, I don't think they really care. They're expanding over to the north side of the map. That's working out pretty well for them. Daggers coming in on top of that, but Scythes are already in place. Is that Scythe trying to avoid getting spotted? Eh, it looks like it couldn't care less. Now the Scythe is coming along nice. Oh, three Scythes. Oh! Anarchid going for the comp snipe. Four sites coming in here. That could be impossible. That start us in place. Dying Friends already kind of prepared when it comes to any forward defenses. Certainly have something to jump back to. And they are playing the Recon Commander, so jumping is absolutely an option. That being said, we do have the sites coming in, and they are going to be spotted by the daggers, so it looks like, no, we aren't going to see any sneaky, any sneaky scythe strategies right now. Dying Friend has made themselves well aware of that possibility, though, again, they were already kind of prepared with the use of that Stardust. So why not just use the Scythes as defensive tools? I mean, that works out. Also, Bolas, for those of you not familiar, the Bolas is a brand new unit. It is essentially a raider, sorry, a riot that uses slow beams. Not sort of like a riot assault, but it's, it has the health of a riot. So yeah, it's really a riot. Mass slow beam comes in there, just wrecks all of the face. And that is what it do. Scythe's coming here trying to deal with this stuff. The boluses are just wrecking everything. Glaive is able to come in from behind. Scythe is able to distract, and we are starting to see a little bit of where that riot element comes in. I think I might have actually mislabeled it. Wait a second, isn't this supposed to be a riot? I thought it was supposed to be a riot. No, maybe not. Wow, no guide material. No one's actually written up the manual information. I mean, I guess it's no... Well, I mean, Mace is a similar thing. It's supposed to be a riot, but I guess it's one of those things where, kind of like the leveler, you have to, or ripper rather, you have to have decent numbers to be able to do damage, but once you have decent numbers, they just wipe out any number of raiders. Speaking of, though, raiding coming in along from Anarchid on the western side of the map, there are Stardust set up to defend against this, which will be able to wreck face. These glaives do not have a clear path up. Oh, never mind. They do just barely have a clear path up. Getting rid of a couple... A couple metal extractors while well at the same time. Bolses are showing that they're just generally useful units. Still, though, Reaver coming in here. You know what? That's really more of a raider. Honestly. It's like if someone made the Seawolf a land unit. Well, hovercraft unit. But you know what I mean. If someone made the Seawolf go above water rather than below water, then we'd see the Bolus. Unfortunately for it, it does not do well against riot units. It's also not especially effective against size. I'm not sure what it's for. I, again, I guess it's for the stuff. Hmm. I guess it's for dealing with a lot of raiders. I mean, just looking at the numbers, it looks to me like a light assault unit. Which is funny, because assault units are largely defined by the fact that they have enough HP to be able to tank any static defenses that they come across. But then again, slow beams. Slow beams reduce the rate of fire, so the static defenses aren't quite as vulnerable. Dying Friend using a tar bit of target manipulation, trying to get some of these spread off the Stardust to deal with these pickets, but 
They are basically just slightly out of range. So clever strategy, but not good enough. Anarchid able to take that out completely. And with that, Anarchid has a very clear advantage on this map. Dying Frame does have an economic advantage, mind you. Anarchid hasn't really been building up a whole lot. They've been focusing a lot on destroying Dying Frame's economy, but Dying Frame does have the economic advantage. The main issue right now is that Anarchid has gotten 1,500 metal more value in fights. And these bolus's are not really showing a whole lot of value yet. That'd be fair, Dying Frame has managed to get themselves at least a bit of a safer position. But I say that right as these sites are coming along the south side of the map and showing that a safe position can only last so long and is, is really relative. Aw, oh, Tufty Indigo. Waiting for Troll Terraforming to make the ramp too steep for hovers. I would actually like to see... I don't... Just double check the patch notes. Terraforming has become different. It's harder to terraform around enemy units right now. The reason for that is to make it possible to balance terraforming around, like, planned terraforms... Or around, basically to lower the cost of terraforming without making it a broken game mechanic, without making it something you just use all the time to win every fight. Because if you can't do it near opponents, when they're right there, that provides a bit wider design space without breaking the game. But I don't recall patch notes that actually stated the terraform cost being reduced. Just patch notes about the terraforming systems being a little bit easier interface-wise. However, it may not matter that Anarchid forced to jump away, and note this is not a map where the water is safe. Anarchid cannot jump into the water as you normally would, and that is going to be the death of their commander. Dying Throne's vengeance is hard and strong. It is not like Anarchid was that far ahead. Again, Anarchid primarily was ahead in terms of attrition, which they are now behind in. They were behind in terms of economy and have been this entire game. There has been no point in this game where Anarchid has been ahead metal income-wise. And Dying Friend showing why that matters. Able to just stockpile units in the back while holding the line just enough that they don't lose the economy that they use to build up what they have. And now the reliance is entirely on this conjurer using the area cloak. There it is. I wasn't sure we'd actually see it, but in this very game, because of course Anarchid loves their cloaking, there's the conjurer area cloak. I'm glad to see it. That does mean, of course, that Dying Fur doesn't know where Anarchist Force is are, which means Dying Fur is being quite aggressive compared to what might be safe. However, considering the fact that Anarchist Forces are still pretty sparse, I mean, there's really just that one forward battalion, and apart from, not battalion, squad. The one forward squad. And that is it. What is Anarchist working on in the background? I mean, they've got to have something. They have, they have knights, they have some glaives. Haven't got much else. Now at this point, with three knights left and Halberds coming in to open everything up, reveal the cloaked units, this is not going to work out too well. And this is actually a very clever strategy. When you come into the Halberds, of course, the knights, they are on fire at will. They were not set to hold fire, so they just shoot off where the Halberds are, and they can be easily found, because the Halberds, when they're closed up and not shooting, they don't get hit very hard. And with that, Anarchid basically has no way of damaging Dying Throne's base without breaking the front lines. Which Dying Throne has pretty strong control over. So this may be the last fight of this game. Bulls coming into the north side. Glaives working to fight and defend their Phantom on the south side, which may not be of the most use just because the Phantom has been revealed. The Bulls are going towards it, but they aren't going to be able to find it before being taken out by the Glaives. Halberd's looking to find anything. They do not find anything. They see a phantom must be in there somewhere, but not able to figure out where it's at, or at least figuring that it's behind their enemy forces. There's no point trying to send halberds towards it yet. It's Lone Scalpel coming in as well, and I'm not sure I totally agree with this. The phantom agrees with me, though. That Lone Scalpel is not going to last one second. And now Diamond Friend, once again, in a bit of an awkward position, having switched over to Gunship, adding Locust to the mix, or at least just starting to. And again, Dying Friend does have that advantage in terms of economy, but Ianarchid once again winning the Attrition War. This Phantom doing wonders to actually win that. And of course, Anarchid, they're about 800 metal ahead when it comes to units to begin with, just because of the fact that this gunship plant was built. Anarchid still running Mono Factory, though it's 20 metal per second, I don't blame them. 
That being said, Anarchid is effectively about 1,500, well, about 2,000 metal ahead when you count the factory costs. Now, how long that'll be relevant remains to be seen is down to these halberds here, and they're doing a wonderful job getting rid of the knights. Two of them haven't gone down, though. Getting rid of that area cloak once again. Bolas halberd combo doing amazing work, actually. The halberd's just tanking for the boluses. The boluses can do their damage. And that means Anarchid once again is in a bit of an awkward position. They're not quite at the point where they're behind army-wise. These glaives are actually very scary. 11... 1,100 metal worth of glaives, but that counts for a lot, especially when you're fighting primarily against scalpels and halberds. The glaives can be highly effective there. Kind of depends on how they're used, though. Knight coming in here is not going to last too long. The halberd bolus combo slows down the knights. The halberds rip them to pieces. But more importantly, the halberds can get behind to this phantom, start taking that out. Once that's gone, it becomes far easier for the rest of the army to deal with this. But again, glaives rip apart halberds, so this is not going to end well for Dying Throne once again. But they remain in an advantage economically, though just barely Anarchid. Just about to crawl over the line on that one. But Dying Throne's commander again, forward, building up, reclaiming. And... At some risk, these glaives don't seem to care right now. I'm not sure the glaives can see the commander even. No, they can't. There's no radar whatsoever. This map is not radar unfriendly. You easily could put radar in the middle of the map and have plenty of vision. Which I believe Anakin's done. Oh, no, it's just the commander. Commanders also automatically have radar modules. Now, it's just part of commanders. I think it's been there for two or three months now. But Dimefrine back with a vengeance. With a vengeance. As the Locusts finally coming in. And while Dimefrine is losing a bit of their economic advantage. Those Locusts are going to be coming around the back. There is what could be the endgame attack. That should be it. Dimefrine forces Anakin to throw in the towel. Locusts coming around the back. It's a bit of a gamble, but it totally worked out. Dimefrine with that metal advantage. Honestly, the real story of the game is the fact that Anakin was able to survive as long as they did. Just with good micro. Because Anarchid was remarkably efficient that entire game, with a slight exception in the center of the game. But for the most part, they were able to completely run away with that army value-wise. But Dime Farm was able to hold on to what they needed to, hold on to the rest as long as they needed to, for them to build up that gunship plant. And with that, they win their round one, and it looks like they are joined by about half of the games so far. Another half of the games are still ongoing. So we'll see if that's truly the case. I'm not 100% sure just because reporting can take a while. Looks like there are still three games that are ongoing. Death and Ezeride, the other game I thought was relatively even, is in fact a 20-minute game so far. So let's go check that out. Let's get to see how that's going. I'm really curious because this was my other pick. Until I saw that it was Anarchid and Dime Throne fighting against each other. Yeah, so people in chat were pointing out that Hovers would have issues with the ramps, and I like the way Dime Friend played that out. They never went up the ramps. Dime Friend always except for one dagger assault in an early game. Dime Friend kept their Hovercrafts on the flat planes, which is where they shine. All Dimefrain needed to do was build up to the gunship build and then just go. That was clearly the strategy. All they needed the hovercrafts for was oops. All they needed the hovercrafts for was to protect the rest of the map so that they could keep doing their work. Oh, I think the game ended while I joined. Yes, it did. Okay. So it looks like we are going to be waiting on round two at this point. Or actually... No, never mind. No, no, no. 400 400's match. That only started five minutes ago. So we should be able to catch pretty much the whole thing there, too. <laughs> Harvey and Victory of the more stuff rule. Oh, yeah. Economy wins. Economy wins games. That was Diamond Friends' entire strategy. Protect the center while building up economy. And then you just go. It's a solid strategy.
Although Anarchid, I think, had a bit of a chance in the mid game. If Anarchid had kept their units alive a bit longer while dealing damage and expanded behind them, like had another couple of workers in the back, or another couple of conjures in the back, that might have been able to do something. Anyway, we have Spider versus Cloaky. I'm not all going for Spiders. 400 going for Cloaky. And in the first five minutes of the game, I'm not null getting heavily damaged. 400 just wrecking face. I didn't expect it to be quite this stark, but apparently I was wrong. Apparently I was very mistaken in how stark it would be. As we're seeing, I'm not null struggling to hold on. And yeah, this. Wow. I literally could have just waited one minute and this game. Well, maybe not quite. I'm not null is not completely down when it comes down to the count when it comes to economy. But they are starting to excess. They are actually unable to build everything they need to. And they also aren't building very much. 400, on the other hand, is just... They are very healthy. I mean, they have... Wait, no. How are they healthy? They only have two conjurers and stuff going into the factory. What is going on here? Okay, I, I, both players are going to be accessing very shortly. I'm not quite sure what is going on here when both players are allowing that access, but 400 at least a little on top of it, getting the caretakers up. I'm not all, on the other hand, does not have caretakers or weavers. Nothing to actually build up, and again, aren't really building a whole lot of things. Weavers coming in to deal with that excess. Unfortunately, that excess is partly due to reclaim, which this weaver is taking, and there's not a whole lot of threat. It's not the worst thing in the world to take reclaim like that, but this weaver really should be going and helping build with the spider factory. It should not be going for reclaim. Reclaim is good to take, just it's being wasted right now. That's the issue. In case you're wondering, don't waste reclaim. So though I'm not null managing to hold on when it comes to their economy, and actually it's slightly ahead when it comes to attrition. I still think 400 has an insurmountable, or nearly insurmountable advantage, but I am not null, not letting that deter them. Going for heavy defense, pretty heavy on the overdrive, or at least trying to. Once they get into the energy backup, that overdrive will kick in. Though even then, they only have three metal extractors at 1.7 each, so the base metal is not empowering a whole lot of overdrive. Throwing a pylon right here, you might be able to pull it off. I don't know, let's see, if you were to throw a... Where is Pylon? There it is. We're gonna throw a Pylon right here. Actually, yeah, Pylon right here would be perfect because that would carry the grid over to the rest of the metal extractors. And that would give you an extra two or three metal per second. Still, the advantage is start much, much starker than that. I don't see I'm not null managing to get out of this. They are holding on well. If they can get rid of these metal extractors to the south, there is actually some hope. But this glaive looking to stuff that hope completely. And I believe will be successful. At the same time, knights are over here, over in the west side of the map. Wrecking all the face they can find. I'm not commander has already jumped. They are now stunned out. That is I'm not commander on their deathbed. The knights finishing that off while Locust coming from the skies. And should be able to force I'm not null to throw in the towel they should they should see this is it this is game the locusts come in and just chew up I am not null's fields and spit out shrapnel I'm not null holding on to the last though as I suppose you do in a tournament but their factory is about to go down and with that their hopes and dreams for winning round one Weavers are still up front, but no, that is it. I'm not null, no, not even GGing, just throwing in the towel. 400 with that massive metal advantage. And yeah, that was a bit anticlimactic. So anyway, we're going to be having round two shortly. Stay tuned for that. We'll just have a short break. And be back when round two has been arranged. So stay tuned.